Well, you may have worked out by now that we didn't make our flight to Hanover, uh, but my name's David Robertson. And my name's Christopher Carter, and we're speaking to you from a hotel in Amsterdam, where we're halfway towards Hanover, so apologies that we're not there this morning. Uh, so we are recording our short uh, presentation to you this morning. Um, before we start, I want to say thanks to the DVRW um, for hosting us and to Carmen Becker for inviting us in the first place. And although we can't be there in person right now for the talk, we will be there later today. And um, anyone who wants to ask us questions or talk about some of the issues that we're going to raise over the next 25 minutes or so, uh, we will be delighted to speak to you. Um, the title of our talk today then is uh, Religious Studies After After World Religions. Um, so I'm a lecturer in Religious Studies at the Open University in the UK. Chris is a lecturer in, universi uh, in Religious Studies at the University of Edinburgh mm -hmm. in the UK. And we have collaborated on a number of things. You may know us from the Religious Studies Project, where we are the founding editors mm -hmm. and current presenters. Um, but we also collaborated on a book which was published back in 2016 called um, After World Religions. Um, Chris will spell out a little bit more of the book um, in a few minutes. Um, but what we want to do today then is to use this opportunity to um, unpack some of the issues that the book raised and some of the issues which it, it flags up for us and, and where the discussion has gone since the publication of the book, so after, after World Religions. Questions including what happens to the study of religion if the comparative categories upon which the discipline is founded um, begin to fall away? Um, can we reconceptualize the field and should we reconceptualize the field? So we're going to discuss and assess some possible ways forward for religious studies after, after world religions. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'll just jump in and I'll try and take uh, less than 10 minutes to go through what the book was trying to do, um, but we attempted to show some of the ways in which we might address the, the, the well-established critique of the world religions paradigm within our own teaching practice. And the book was divided into three sections. Um, so after David and I laid out the, the, the path that's been well-trod by Tim Fitzgerald, Tal al-Assad, Tomoko, Masuzawa, etc. And we then had a section which we called subversive pedagogies. Um, and this section addressed the fact that for many academics, simply starting from scratch um, with a new paradigm in your teaching practice is, is not necessarily <coughs> an option, whether that's through institutional pressures, tradition, student preference, political factors or other reasons. In many cases, the only way that we can actually reform the system is to employ subversive pedagogy. So working within an established world religions model and, and critiquing it from within. And so we had these chapters um, that made up the um, volume, uh, th th this section. And the first came from Steve Sutcliffe and described his experience of, of teaching new age formations, as he calls them, in, in the context of a world religions paradigm structured introductory course, a context which for many of us, whatever our level is a somewhat necessary evil. It's what the students come to university to study. It's what they expect. The second chapter offered a different take on the same problem with uh, Tara, Brad and Mike here focusing on the role of postgraduate tutors, graduate instructors um, who don't have the power to challenge the structure of the introductory courses on which they're teaching, but um, who are nevertheless presented with opportunities for critical reflection and sort of metacritical um, subversion of the course structure itself. And then Stephen Ramey um, also reflected on his experiences of using world religions textbooks as data um, to, to critically introduce um, the, the, the destabilizing of the world religions paradigm. So Remy argued, for example, that, that one thing that we can do in our teaching of world religions courses is rather than stating, say, quote, Judaism has three main branches, we should state 
These three groups are commonly identified as the main branches of Judaism. And this is in order to sow a kernel of doubt that's quite subversive to the declarative nature of the world religions paradigm. And he demonstrates that subverting the paradigm through subjecting it to a critical analysis requires different assessment practices and often different examples of potential strategies from careful framing of exam questions to shifting the focus from specific terms to the representation, asking students to identify the perspective or interest being promoted when a particular source uh, asserts that such and such is standard within a certain religion. So he's really focusing on the language that we use and how we can still teach the world religions paradigm, but um, just by adding a few extra words in there and not just saying these are the branches of Judaism, say, these are commonly considered the branches for these reasons. And it just makes a real difference. Um, the next section um, of the book we called um, Alternative Pedagogies and we subtitled it Power and Politics. And this is assuming that one is in a position to propose courses that don't involve a world religions model, um, what options are there? So this section explored theoretical models that could be used to explore and interrogate the category of religion without following the world religions paradigm. So of particular importance here was the issue of power. And we had these um, four chapters that made up this section. I'll just um, highlight um, Paul Tremlett's chapter. Um, here he turned ex discussion explicitly to the critical study of religion and to Karl Marx, whose thinking underlay many of the contribu contributions to this section. And Tremlett suggests that by engaging students in a critical reading of Marx in order to destabilize their assumption of reason as some objective or disinterested force. And this can move them towards a conception of reason as a social practice beyond the binary of subject-centered reason and experience, as suggested, he says, by Marcuse, Adorno, Habermas, and others. And this is done to demonstrate that the students are themselves implicated in the history of the world religions paradigm and in the idea of religion itself. So this is something that we are all too aware of at this conference. I'm sure. And another example from that section was Craig Martin's um, courses. He had uh, Religions of the East. He had the Evolution of Jesus. So already the, these are sort of subversively titled courses, perhaps. Um, and he, he, he talks about how we can use a scaffold of theoretical questions, but use particular data or content drawn from various world religions in order to meet students halfway. And in these courses, Martin demonstrates how we can deliver the basic content that students desire, the world religion's data, uh, whilst taking a sort of what he calls a quasi-Marxist functionalist approach to show how these basics are used, reused, and recycled in the service of various social agendas in different times and places. So the idea of that section was, well, here's the critique of the paradigm. Let's try and employ that in, in the very structure of our teaching. And the final section, um, we called Innovative Pedagogies, does what it says and it's on the tin, to quote our, our uh, friend and colleague Steve Sutcliffe. Um, and, and by this point, the volume, we thought, had, had critiqued the paradigm, subverted it, provided alternatives to it. But um, what innovative pedagogical measures might there be to help us um, put um, this uh, critique and model into practice? Um, and these four chapters um, made up the section. And I just want to hi highlight um, a couple again. We had Carol Cusack's um, chapter on archeology span and the world religions paradigm. And uh, in this chapter, she interrogates the idea that self-contained, boundaried world religions spread across geographical and temporal locations and then subjugated the indigenous religions of the dominated societies. And, and, and the alternative entry point that she uses is the archaeological data of uh, European Neolithic peoples. And it might seem somewhat counterintuitive to claim that archaeology is an innovative pedagogical technique, but Cusack demonstrates that utilizing sites such as um, Stonehenge or the Stones of Stenness, um, these, are, these are beautiful sites and they're remarkable. They have the capacity to fascinate students and fire their imaginations, but by getting them to think how religious studies relates to prehistory and materiality and not just to texts and belief systems, it's possible to shift emphasis away from 
the world religions paradigm towards other models that are perhaps more non-elitist, non-normative, fluid, and so on. And then the final one that I just want to, to flag up is Michel Desjardins chapter about um, foods um, in which he presents his uh, Desjardins diet for world religions paradigm loss. Um, and this is based on a course that he runs at Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada. And, and yes, this thematic approach to food is, you know, itself uh, an important example of how using alternative data can destabilize paradigms. Um, and the diet he prescribes here is particularly relevant beyond the context. And he describes these nine specific factors that are built into his course with several goals in mind, one of which was to undermine the world religions paradigm. Um, I'm not going to expand on them. I'm just going to allow them to, to speak for themselves in this context because we don't have too much time. But he says that, um, well, if we're lucky enough, you should construct the course at a senior level when students have had some grinding but refrain from adding course prerequisites. Select accessible readings that deconstruct traditional representations of religion. Describes making interviews the core learning component for students. So I guess that's about getting uh, things away from the sort of elitist text dominated model. Insist that religion not be conflated with religious dogma. Legitimize narrative data. Choose a course topic with current appeal. Again, that makes some sort of sense. Build personal reflection into each class. And that's something I've really started to try and do at the start of each teaching period now and sort of ask students, you know, how would you define this? Where would you put these terms? And then get them a few weeks later to think, go back to what you wrote that time. How has your thinking changed? Why? And then get them to think about what they've been doing. Um, and drawing connections to broader global phenomena later in the course. This isn't just a selling pitch for After World Religions, that's just to give you a flavour of, of the kind of things that we wanted to cover in it. And just before I pass over to David, who's going to engage with some of the, the, the critiques that the book has, has rightly faced, um, I, I like this, uh, this quotation from the, the late Jonathan Z. Smith. He says that, as long as we do not allow ourselves to be misled by that sad heresy that the bachelor's degree is but a preparation for graduate studies, then there is nothing that must be taught there is nothing that cannot be left out. A curriculum, whether represented by a particular course, a program, a four-year course of study, becomes an occasion for deliberate, collegial, institutionalized choice. And perhaps, we hoped, with After World Religions, if we can all internalize this message and be given the space to do so, then our anxieties surrounding meeting student expectations against this culturally intransigent world religions paradigm might not seem so pressing perhaps we can own the choices that we're making a little bit more and then be proud about what we're presenting to turn then to some of the critiques of the book um i, I want to focus on two reviews particularly um one thing that's important to remember before i go into these is although we're both lecturers now that mm. wasn't the case when we started work on the book it was the first uh, book either of us had written well uh, edited in this case mm. and <clears throat> our, our first time dealing with the publisher as the, as the person in charge of a large work let's put it mm. that way and I was just coming to the end of my PhD and you were maybe halfway through so um, that's just to set the scene um, because uh, one thing was that the Short. The title as it is now is actually a shortened title. It was originally meant to be called Afterworld Religions, Reconstructing the Introductory Course in Religious Studies. Um, the shortened version was suggested by the publisher and we agreed, uh, but it did give... Um, it's, it a suggested lofty, yeah. a more ambitious task than we had planned for the book. We had meant it to be quite specific. But nevertheless, this may be apropos... Uh, and I'll come back to that later. Okay, so uh, the first I want to look at is Wanda Albert's review in Newman last year. Um, and uh, the, the quote up there, you know, the chapters of the book provide an interesting starting point for the attempt to overcome the WRP as a framework for teaching the study of religions at the university level. However, they also show how much scholars are struggling to free themselves and their teaching from the constraints of this paradigm, which is ever so present, not only in public discourse about religion, but also within academia. 
Some articles also document the individual author's struggles with working against what they themselves have been socialised into. Now this is an interesting point and as editors we were also surprised how few alternatives there were approached. Um, we've seen, you know, most were coming from a critical perspective which we ourselves work in so mm -hmm. perhaps we were slightly biased towards that. But nonetheless, we had a few based on alternative data. You know, archaeology is you know, from Cusack, food from Desjardins. And um, most substantively, perhaps, Suzanne's Owen, uh, Suzanne Owen's piece on using ideas of sacredness or processes of sacredness rather than a religion per se. However, I want to flag up again that uh, the fact that this book was prepared by graduate students with lots to prove and little to lose may be part of this mm -hmm. and actually getting people to contribute was much harder than you might um, than certainly than we expected um, this uh, also helps to set up the second review far more critical review that I want to um, to address uh, by Ilse Morgenstein first in the religious studies review published in 2017 um, I have a couple of quotes here. Um, the volume, first and foremost, falls short of diversifying the discourse on world religions. Three of its 17 authors identify as women. Most contributors are white. All are currently related in European and North American contexts. If we may judge by their biographical blurbs, most contributors to the volumes focus exclusively on Western critical theory and or European and American contexts. These authors repeat across chapters the claim that religion came to be identified vis-a-vis -vis power, colonial, imperial and institutional. A majority male, overwhelmingly white and decidedly Euro-American pool of contributors and case studies does little to disrupt the power dynamics this volume purports to critique. What work does after world religions accomplish when it continues a tradition of absences of a diversity of gender, racial, sexual, ability and subject matter? Now, there are genuine concerns here and these are genuine failings of the book. The diversity of the book is uh, not what it should have been. This was not through intent. This was simply the way that things played out and there were... Um, there were other versions of the book that might have been. Nonetheless, we were not in a position either professionally nor with the publisher to prov to make this a um, definitive, a compendious or... book. Mm. This was a quickly produced book in order to keep the conversation going um, and to lead to discussions like this. Um, there are also a lot of assumptions here. For instance, uh, how do they know anything about the sexuality of the people involved? They're not, it's not true that they're all European and American. Um, there are other issues of diversity. There's no mention of class here, social class, for instance. There are lots of early career scholars which we deliberately wanted to give opportunities to. We couldn't do everything. We did what we could. It could have been better, no doubt about that. However, um, you know, she builds on this, she claims, uh, you know, uh, the volume claims to rebuild an entire field. I can see why she uh, took it that way. That wasn't our intent. While its authors seem content to use the master's tools in its reconstruction, the exclusion of marginalised and minoritised voices from this uh, crucial project is therefore all the more noticeable and frankly unconscionable replicating as it does the presumption that people of colour, queer people, disabled people and non-Western people do not do theory. The conspicuous, inexcusable lack of representation um, uh, means the volume falls far uh, short of its goal by replicating and reinscribing violent histories of exclusion. Um, Best, it offers a reconstruction that has merely reordered and repurposed the materials it seeks to critique and discard using the master's tools, uh, she says, to paraphrase. No, no, not to paraphrase, but to reorder the quote for, uh, for speed. Um, as we said in the introduction, we talked about moving the chairs and the Titanic. It's a quote from, uh, from Steve Sutcliffe. We might also use um, Mallory Nye's terms from his recent paper on decolonization. Um, it's not, the issue is not about putting more chairs around the table. Mm -hmm. It's about changing the table itself. Now, 
we are talking about a decolonization of knowledge rather than a political decolonization. Our, our aim was never to say there should be more world religions. The point was to change the very, uh, to change the master's tools. Now, we've attempted to identify and under, undermine the master's tools. Now, I do not doubt that some will disagree that we were the people to do it, um, and that is their right. But I don't see how it would be preferable if we remained silent. Mm -hmm. We did what we could with the tools we had at the time. And um, it's unfortunate that that's uh, not the approach that some other people would, would look at. But it does lead into um, the issue of whether uh, religious studies has moved from uh, a study of ideas related to ethnicity as it was in its um, in its comparative heyday into something that's about representing identity um, and that's problematic in itself. Um, Chris you wanted to talk about another uh, mm -hmm. approach to this. Yeah so we're, we're already running out of time so I just wanted to jump through so, so an alternative that, that's been gaining traction at the moment although how new it is it is it goes back to Nini and Smart in a sense, but Anne Taves has been popularising uh, with Elliot Eam and Egil Asprey and this idea of um, looking at uh, worldviews um, as a way forward to provide an overarching rubric that, that can maybe get us past looking at people in these different silos of being religious, non-religious, part of world religions and so on. She says that this provides a neutral starting point that's not biased towards religious categories and points out that in many educational contexts, as we know in, in the UK certainly, religion is now becoming broadened and subsumed under the notion of religions and non-religious worldviews or religions and worldviews. And she uses um, concepts such as ways of life and big questions that relate to ontology, epistemology, axiology, praxeology and cosmology as ways of getting at these worldviews. And this desire to move away from <coughs> distinctions between religion and non-religion towards the study of these worldviews or existential cultures, as Lois Lee might call them, and so on. This is all well and good. Indeed, as Lee said, the way in which humans conceptualize their own existence and the nature of reality is intrinsically transcendent and cuts across religious and non-religious divides. However, every time I read about this and hear about this, I'm always asking, what about the unremarkable or the mundane um, studies that are guided by questions on what it means to be religious or secular or on what do people believe are bound from the start to produce models of religion and non-religion that end up focusing upon the profound, the transcendent, the meaningful, and a focus upon big questions, no matter what the, the critical or destabilizing intent, I would say is doomed to play into the hands of the vested interests that want to make religion and non-religion all about addressing the inevitable questions of life, the universe, and everything that were pondered by deep thought in Douglas Adams's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In these cases, we end up with typologies of existential culture. Or in the case of my own master's project, for <coughs> example, many years ago, um, I, I, I typologized my students into four types, which were naturalistic, philosophical, spiritual, humanistic. This suggests that there's an unwitting reification going on here. Uh, just like the Magrathians who constructed deep thought, these studies seem to know what they're looking for, but are perhaps not asking the right question. And now this reification is perhaps rooted in reality in some way when people talk about religion. Like, just think about the whole science-religion discourse. Why do people think there is even a connection there? Like, it is a popular thing, the idea that religion and related concepts are all about meaning um, and although we might want to ask some critical questions of the underlying research um, Smith and Cragen write that research has already shown the centrality of science critical thinking and skepticism to atheists and other non-religious individuals and how their religious counterparts tend to have less confidence in science the non-religious create systems of belief out of available cultural resources and often in dialectic relationship with religion and its claims about the nature of the cosmos so you know it does seem that big questions are heavily implicated in what we might call the religion-related field um, and are perhaps much more likely to provoke positioning of social actors in subject positions relating to the category of religion. However, 
I think it's incumbent upon scholars to acknowledge the role of their guiding assumptions about religion and non-religion in the production of their conclusions. You know, acknowledging and attempting to understand a prevalent discursive entanglement between religion and uh, meaning making and science, that is in itself a worthy project. Attempting to understand and map ways of life and responses to big questions, that's also, I would say, a, a worthy project. But allowing one's interest in the latter to tarnish the former by obscuring the contingent, socially constructed nature of the so-called debate, I would say, is critically problematic, normative and ideologically loaded and makes me very reticent to use worldviews as, as an alternative. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just me weighing in on a contemporary issue. But that feeds into, because that is one way in which religious studies could be reconceptualized as a department, is it the study of worldview? Well, and indeed that's happening to some degree in secondary education in Britain now, where there's been a movement towards talking about religion and worldviews um, so that they can, you know, uh, those with religion and without religion, it's, mm. uh, you know, um, RS survives by finding religion um, in the denial of religion. Um, to loop back then in the last few minutes, uh, make some quick points. Now, I talked about the shortening of the title earlier on and how it may be apropos. So what I'd like to do in these last few minutes then is talk about um, reconstructing religious studies part of the title. Um, and I asked at the beginning, you know, can we reconceptualize the field and should we reconceptualize the field? Um, should we continue with RS as a university department is essentially the question I'm asking. Um, on, the, on the plus side, um, we have certainly a powerful and problematic discourse in religion, perhaps one of the most uh, complex entanglements of public and academic and political discourse. Um, and, you know, and, and the relationship between the Western imperial power and, and the rest of the world as well. Um, and surely this deserves study. And I think we would probably all agree with that. The slipperiness of the concept and the interdisciplinarity of its study that arises from that as well is a very interesting thing. It means that we can talk about the range of subjects and data that we have at this conference here today. There's no other discipline that's quite as varied in both the topics and, and how we deal with them. Um, and we might say that if we lose RS as a department that we are ceding ground to the to the theologians and, and others with a normative agenda. Well, possibly true. But let's also think, um, according to uh, Leonardo Ambasciano in his recent uh, book An Unnatural History of Religions, there is no uh, field so historically dominated by pseudoscience as uh, the study of religion. And that is painfully obvious in the modern field um, as social scientific approaches to the study of religion continue to lose ground. Um, in the UK and the US, at the very least, I'm not sure what the situation is in Europe, um, we have to take into account that the vast majority of scholars do not accept the critiques we've presented in this book and, and, and don't even want to hear them, in fact. I regularly am told that my work is just arguing about um, definitions and that it doesn't matter to real people on the ground. Um, and yet, it is these uh, scholars who will rise to positions of power um, due to the explicit or tacit support from uh, religious interest groups, particularly in these days where funding is very short. The world religions paradigm is so embedded in the logic of the religious studies department that it has in many cases all but destroyed the possibility of challenge or change. And these are the same scholars who shape the narrative for the media and for policy makers. Note, for example, the recent British Academy report, which I know many of you will have been aware of, um, which doesn't differentiate at all between religious studies and the study of the divine. Um, and whether this is through ignorance or deliberate dissemblance makes little difference. Perhaps religious studies then is a poison chalice. Perhaps um, religious studies existence actually benefits uh, religionists more than those with a social scientific or other um, science based approach. The founding of the IHR and the initial publication, uh, initial issue of Newman, I think 1954, 
discussed the issue that um, a particular subject needs a particular object, um, a, a particular methodology. Um, now, perhaps we might turn this on its head. If we agree that we don't have a particular object of study, perhaps we don't need a, sp a particular subject. Approaching the 20th anniversary next year of Timothy Fitzgerald's ideology of religious studies, perhaps it's time we start to seriously consider that after world religions, after phenomenology, might actually mean after religious studies. And I'm going to stop there. Go and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, and we'll see you later on.